President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I, I know that I know I'm about 25 minutes early, but since in the great greeting ceremony for the president of Sri Lanka this morning out here, six people passed out from the <laughs> warmth, I just couldn't stand it sitting in there and seeing you out here, and I wouldn't want to come out here and find a lot of bodies lying there. So I decided to come out early. But there is one other thing I'd like to leave up to you, since the Republican Party is a party of individuals and all. Now, I have a speech here that I was going to make, not too long. I learned a long time ago about keeping speeches short, but um, I just wondered, would you rather have the speech or would you rather have a question and answer session and for us, the little bit of time we've got to ask some questions? <laughs> questions? Okay. <laughs> that is a question I ask in here of the people that schedule me almost daily. Uh, it seems like those trips to the ranch are getting further and further between. And uh, if you will all help and I get reelected, I'm going to set a new schedule that's going to see me get to the <laughs> there more often. <laughs> but uh, I guess the next visit is uh, July 28th when I come out to open the Olympics. Now, yeah. Uh, now listen, I admire your spirit and all of that, but just let me tell you one thing. Please get scared. Uh, don't, don't get overconfident. President Dewey told me that I should n never be too optimistic. So uh, really, there are problems. There, with all the additional registration that they've been doing, the big drive that they've been making and all, I think that we ought to consider that we're one vote behind and run that way all the way to November. And, uh, and then at least get us one vote ahead. Uh, well, yes? Now, wait a minute. The, the domestic content bill, uh, I have to be opposed to that. That is another form of protectionism. And you may save somebody's job here, but no one turns around to see how many jobs were lost behind them by virtue of such a bill. No, I have to oppose it. Domestic content, you know, and that is that anything that is built and imported to this country, like an automobile, has to have X percent of American manufactured parts in it. And uh, it may sound good in the surface, but as I say, it, uh, they usually, I am a veteran of the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that Great Depression, as we look back from hindsight, and it was a worldwide depression, and if you think the recession we've just been through was anything serious, it was a breeze compared to that Great Depression. More than 25% of the total workforce unemployed, and there were no programs of unemployment insurance or anything of the kind. But one of the things that perpetuated, as you look back, is we rushed out with all kinds of government cures, and one of them was the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Bill that set high penalizing tariffs. Well, of course, then every other country in the world did the same thing uh, in retaliation. And I think it had an awful lot to do with the, res with the Great Depression going on as long as it did. And don't let anyone ever fool you about this. None of the panaceas, none of the government make work projects really ended the Great Depression. World War II ended the Great Depression. And that's a pretty expensive way. Yes. What is be the most significant accomplishment in the first term? What do I think it would be in a second term? Uh, and I won't repeat your first line there. Uh, I think maybe overall, well, of course, there is, in the face of all the prognostications that it wouldn't happen, the economic recovery, which has now become economic expansion, uh, 
is something, but more than that, I've been traveling the mashed potato circuit long before I ever thought I would want to hold public office or do hold public office. And all those years I was speaking out, having started out as a New Deal Democrat, I had converted myself and was beginning to speak out against government's increasing intervention in the private sector, government's increasing taking over of things that the people should be doing for themselves. And I think to look now and see that the debate in Congress for three and a half years now has not been as it has been for almost 50 years, a debate of how much more should we spend on new programs and things of that kind, is that the debate is over how much should we cut spending. Uh, there's no one saying we shouldn't cut. It's just how much should you cut. That is one, and I'd have to tie to it another one. When we took office, our defense posture was so low, the morale of our forces so low, that we had no reenlistment. On any given day, 50% of our airplanes could not fly for lack of spare parts. 50% of our ships in the Navy couldn't leave port, not only for lack of spare parts, but for lack of crew. And today, we have a waiting list we have the highest percentage of high school graduates in the armed forces that we've ever had in our history, even when in wartime we had a complete draft. We have the highest reenlistment rate, and we have a, a readiness posture, meaning the equipment and everything it would take if there is an emergency. And the morale in our armed forces is just something that I get a lump in my throat when I, when I see those young men and women out there that are in, in uniform. Their spirit, their morale. I get letters. I got one from uh, an 18-year-old in a submarine uh, who wrote a letter and he said, we may not be the biggest Navy in the world, we're the best. And I got a letter from an ambassador who'd gone up on the East German frontier and uh, saw some American troops that are over there. And so he came back to his helicopter and a young 19-year-old trooper followed him this was one of our armored regiments, followed him and he said can the ambassador, could you get a message to the president? Well, being an ambassador, he allowed it how he could. He said, well, would you tell him, we're proud to be here and we ain't scared of nothing. So that kind of sums it up for me. <laughs> Yes, we are. We're having a big fight in the Congress on that right now, but it is absolutely necessary. Those people in El Salvador have proven in three elections when the guerrilla slogan was on each election day, vote today and die tonight. And they still, in percentages almost double the percentage of voters that we turn out, they voted for democracy. They voted to have peace and freedom. And I think we're morally obligated to stay with them. And what we're doing in Nicaragua is nothing more nor less than this. A totalitarian government in Nicaragua, every bit as totalitarian as in Cuba and the Soviet Union, is supplying, training, and directing the guerrillas trying to overthrow that democratic government in El Salvador. Well, as long as they're doing this, I think we've got an obligation to support the people of Nicaragua who also want to be free. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm sure you can be invited to the inaugural ball, uh, and all of you, for the work that you're doing, um, if, if and when. I always have to say that. I'm superstitious. But um, the first part of your question, the, your first question here, uh, again, was the advice to those of you who might aspire to positions even uh, this one. Uh, there's some drawbacks in this one, too. <laughs> but um, the advice is, is what you're doing and keep on being active in political life. Now, you may find out 
Because as I say, I started out with no idea that I would ever do anything of this kind. But being a performer, I had always thought that I, I had to pay my dues. And that meant that I should take advantage of the fact that as a performer, I could attract an audience and so forth. So I campaigned for the people and the causes that I believed in. And it was through that campaigning one day that a group of my fellow Republicans uh, landed on me in 1965 and insisted that I had to run for governor. And again, believe me, I was a reluctant dragon. <laughs> I did not want to do that. I have to say it has turned out to be the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life. But you stay with it, and as you help, you will see, and if you still then have a desire for public life, you will see for yourself what is the best avenue uh, to start by getting elected to a, a local or a state position a, in the legislature or whatever it might be, you, and you'll have the know-how then as to how, how to go about it. But it comes from remaining active, remaining good citizens who say, I'm not just going to sit home or maybe just go out and vote when Election Day comes. I'm going to help making the things I believe in uh, come true. And that is the other thing. Don't seek public office just because you think it looks like a good job. Really believe in something that you want to see accomplished in government, and then it's worthwhile. <laughs> and then also, um, my question is, do you feel that the youth of today, compared to our past, are being sufficiently prepared to take over the country? Because not all of us can run this country when the time comes. Are you being properly prepared to, to run the country and to take over? Let me just say that when we appointed some time ago a commission on education, because we were frightened by the decline in the quality of education in this country, the superiority of students in other countries over ours in the uh, SAT tests and all. Out of that has come a realization, but also we can be optimistic because out of that commission has come great reforms. There are 50 states that have already at the state level started implementing many of the reforms recommended by that commission, and we're continuing with that. But so I'm now reassured uh, that you will be. I had to say earlier in some of the things they found, when they found students in our universities who didn't know which side of the war we were on in World War II, uh, I had to say, wait a minute, <laughs> somebody's leaving something out here in the things that they're, they're teaching you. But I think already there has been uh, a great improvement and a remedying of that, uh, that situation. And so I think, but also the very experience that you yourselves are getting here and what you're doing is going to prepare you for that. There. Yes, there is something in particular. An awful lot of what we've done and are doing here is one of the best kept secrets in American public life. Uh, I can go out and make a speech and then I look at the TV news at night. And I know what I said in the speech and I see, I see myself saying about 12 words, uh, very innocuous words, not the real meat of the speech or anything. And then I see myself continue but no sound and a commentator's voice comes over the scene of me telling the people what he or she says that I said in the speech, usually quite inaccurate and missing the best parts. But the, the demagoguery that has gone on in fighting all the things we've done, you've heard, for example, that our economic reform program was not fair, that we were unfair. Our tax cut was unfair. It benefited the wealthy and not the poor. Well, how many people out there know, and yet I know I've been trying to say this and tell it whenever I can, but all of you arm yourself with the facts. We learned in making motion pictures, back in those days when I was in that career, that the most effective advertising, in spite of all the billboards and trailers and everything else, was word of mouth. People went to a movie because a neighbor said, hey, have you seen that picture down at the Bijou Theater? 
Now, the same thing is true here. Your word of mouth to people in these things. For example, how many of you know that as a result of our tax cut, the percentage of the overall income tax that is being paid by the people below $25,000 of income has vastly declined. The percentage of the tax being paid by people over $100,000 of income has vastly increased. So we didn't have a tax that benefited the rich and penalized the poor. It, the very reverse was true. How many of you have heard that we've, our cuts in the budget have been such that the poor are not being taken care of, the elderly are being neglected. I heard a mayor of San Francisco say this in the air the other night, the great problems of the hungry and the poor and the elderly. Well, the average couple on Social Security today is getting $170 a month more than they were getting when we came here. The federal government is subsidizing 95 million meals a day, every day, in the United States. The truth of the matter is, we didn't really cut anything to less than what it was. If we did, had, the budget would be smaller than when we came. All we've succeeded in doing is cutting the rate of increase in the spending. When, under the law, when I submit a budget, I have to give a projection of where, if that budget's passed, where it goes us over the next five years, where it takes us. If we were following the projected five-year budgets of Jimmy Carter's administration, the deficit today would be $90 billion bigger than it is. So when someone tells you that we're, we're providing more food stamps, what we have done is we've set some limits because we found an awful lot of people who really didn't have a moral right to be accepting government aid because of the level of their earnings that we took them off and redirected our spending down to people who were poorer. For example, we set a standard that 130% of the poverty level of income, below that level, you're eligible for government help. Above that level, you're on your own. We found people who were making almost 200% of the poverty level income and were getting government programs. We have increased the grants and loans to needy students from college by 52% since we've been here. Now, I'd only cite these as things find out, and then you bet you can do a job. If you're the one that can raise your hand in a group and say, wait just a minute, and correct the demagogue that is out there uh, with all the cliches. And I'm keeping you here too long because you're beginning to melt. Do you have a presentation for me? I bet you were here in the summer of 81, the first one here. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Mr. President, may I introduce to you Megan Lott, who is the Organizational Director of National Teenage Republicans. Megan? Mr. President, we think you are the absolute greatest, and we all love you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. We love Nancy, too. On behalf of teenage Republicans all across the country, we would like to present you this very special plaque. I'm gonna, I'll let you, you can hold it if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read the inscription. Oh, Sorry. all right. OK. <laughs> the inscription reads, President Ronald W. Reagan, 1980 through 1989. Big, yeah. big men, big men wear big shoes and dream big dreams. Mr. President, thank you for making America great again and ensuring our future. Presented by National Teenage Republican Leadership Conference, June 17th through 22nd, 1984. And Mr. President, as a postscript on our feelings about the fall campaign, I'd like you to read the last line of our plaque. It says, let's give Fritz the boot. Yeah. 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 Well, if I needed any inspiration, I have it now. I'll try my darndest to fill these boots. And with regard to dreaming dreams, yes, and don't you be afraid to dream dreams. That's what made this country what it is. Dream and then go after those dreams. That's what it's all about. And we'll do our darndest if we have those next several years 
whatever time we've got left, to try and hand you a little head start on those dreams of what this country can be, we'll keep on swinging back here. But God bless you all. Thank you very much. This is. Well, thank you all very much. Well, oh, I, you're still hands are going up there, and I, I know. All right, all right. Listen, I can take, I can take one more. I'll take one more question, and that's because we have run out of time, and uh, and you've you're going to be running out of <laughs> comfort here. In a, About a new party? Yes. Well, there's a, that, that always goes on. There are people that, uh, and sometimes they have very uh, worthwhile goals and aims. If they do, and if they're not going off on some tangent uh, that takes them in the opposite direction of everything we believe in, then the best thing that we can do is to try and convince them that um, uh, cooperating with our party is maybe the quickest way to get started on the things that they aspire to. If we've got the if they've got the same goals and they look the same goals as we have, uh, let's go after them and tell them that uh, together maybe we can bring about some of their their dreams. And I, I don't know of any better suggestion than that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Uh, my time is up and I'm I know. Uh, you, uh, I thought that I was in the worst climate in the world in Sacramento as governor, but uh, here, no, you really melt. <laughs> it's, um, it's terrible. Well, again, I wish we could stay here longer. All right. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I'm going to be very proud of her. Oh. Listen, no, wait a minute. No, I, you guys. Now, wait, wait one second. Till I, I'll come right back. <laughs> um, you forgot to tell us one thing. What we do with it? Stand.